welcome. I am Jesse Isley with Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. I am so excited to be here with you tonight as we continue celebrating DIA. DIA is Diversity in Action. We've been celebrating the Children's Day of the Book throughout April with special online programs. DIA is a celebration of children, families, and reading that emphasizes the importance of literacy for children of all linguistic and cultural backgrounds. You can learn more about our upcoming DIA programs on our website. Tonight's program is extra special, and so I'm thrilled to introduce Irania Patterson, an Outreach Services Specialist here at the library, to tell you more about tonight's guest. Welcome, Irania. Thank you so much. And I have the honor to introduce tonight Sonia Manzano. Imagínense, Sonia Manzano, what a privilege. And Sonia is a first generation mainland Puerto Rican raised in the South Bronx. In the early 1970s, a scholarship took her to Carnegie Mellon University where she participated in the creation of Broadway show, Hit Gospel. From there, she went on to affect the lives of millions of parents and children when she was offered the opportunity to create the role of Maria. Y quien no conoce Maria de Sesame Street? Imagínense. And after 44 years, she dedicated that she ded decided to retire from Sesame Street and, and author books. Her book titles include a uh, revolution of Evelyn Serrano and a uh, memoir, Becoming Maria, Love and Chaos in the South Bronx. Becoming Maria was praised by Kirkus Reviews for its lyrical and unflinching account of her tough New Yorican upbringing in, upbringings in the South Bronx and calls it a touching memoir. Manzano lovingly details life-changing moments with a stark and heartbreaking contrast to her Sesame Street character. She penned three picture books with Simon and, Sh and, and Sh uh, Schuster, and her latest book called A World Together aimed to promote unity by celebrating cultural and generational diversity. Recently, Escolastics and Manzano partnered to launch two middle grade novels and two picture books, the first of which is coming up Cuban, coming up Cuban. Um, I, I can't wait to read that, read that one, which will be released in summer of this year, summer 2022. Coming Up Cuban is set in 1959 and follows the lives of four children who each represent different intersections of race and class in Cuba. Mrs. Manzano has created and developed with Fred Rogers Productions an animated children's program for PBS, Alma's Way premiere in October 2021. And before we greet her, before we, we greet, greet her, please, let's watch this short video that we have been uh, as, having here as a surprise. So after that, we will meet Sonia Manzano. Everybody, it's a pleasure for me to be here and thank you, Irania, very much for that lovely, lovely introduction. I hope everybody enjoyed that very short video about me. You've just seen my whole entire 44 years on Sesame Street compressed into a three minute video. It was a lot of work to do for the 
editor at Sesame Workshop, but she did the very best she could. Well, that was my my life on Sesame Street. You might remember some of it. I, I sometimes feel that I forgot a lot of it. I actually see segments of Sesame Street that I've done years ago, and I don't remember actually doing it, but I'm actually kidding. I remember almost every second of the 44 wonderful years that I spent on Sesame Street. I feel like I led a double life for 44 years, the real life of Sonia Manzano, mother and actress and author, and the fantasy life of Maria on Sesame Street. Uh, mother and, and wife and, and fix-it shop owner and, and toaster fixer. As a matter of fact, if you notice, I fixed the same toaster for 44 years. It was just a prop for me to manipulate before we got into the real scenes. So I feel that my life, Sonia Manzano's life and Maria's life on Sesame Street kind of ran neck and neck. In the beginning, humans were more featured on Sesame Street more than Muppets. So I was wooed and, and fell in love and got married. And I even had a baby on the show. When I think of it, we were like the first reality show, really, without the whining. Actually, uh, when I married Emilio Delgado, the gentleman who played Luis on Sesame Street, people thought that Emilio Delgado and I were really married. Uh, actually, we were once recognized by a fan in the street and she ran up to us and she gushed and she was very excited. And she said how wonderful it was that Sesame Street would show real love happen between two people and that her children should see real love happen. Well, we told her, we told her, Senora, we're not really married. She sucked in her breath and said, well, as long as you really love each other. So she was determined to believe that we were really an in love couple, no matter what we said. And the fact of the matter was that, was that we were very close friends, but I was married to someone at the time, my real husband, Richard Reagan. And in that wedding sequence with Emilio Delgado, I was actually four months pregnant with my child, Gabriella. But children believe in Big Bird and Elmo and Oscar the Grouch as much as they believe in my fictitious marriage. As a matter of fact, the belief is so great. We once had a four-year-old visitor in the studio and unbeknownst to Carol Spinney, who plays Big Bird, the four-year-old saw Carol Spinney take the top half of his Big Bird suit off. But no worries, though the child witnessed this, the child turned to her parent and said, Mommy, does Big Bird know there's a man in him? I retired from Sesame Street in 2015. I joke saying that I retired because 44 years was long enough for me to wait for Oscar the Grouch to propose because he is my favorite character. Still, you might wonder how I could have stayed on a show that lasts and lasts and lasts as long as Sesame Street has. How many different ways can you teach the alphabet? How many times can you count to 20? How many times can I correct Big Bird and Elmo and all the other furry creatures on the show about the very same things? A reason I stayed on the show for so long was that every generation of children gave me the opportunity to do better by them, the opportunity to get things right. I wanna tell you a little bit about the origins of the show. It blasted out of the 1960s. America was a different place then. It was divided but there was something more idealistic about it. It was youth driven. It was so youth driven. The joke was you shouldn't trust anybody over the age of 35. Technology was in the dark ages. There was no internet, no DVD, no on demand. We couldn't even refer to Big Bird's yellow feathers because not everybody had a color television set. The country, was going through great social upheaval. 
marked by the civil rights movement. We were influenced by Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Anyway, everybody wanted a change and everybody had a platform and women wanted to join the workforce for the first time. And it was a big thing for a woman to want to have a job. And uh, I remember women going downtown and burning their bras in protest. I laugh now. I think if we did that, we'd have to burn our spanxes. But spanxes don't burn. I believe that they would melt. Anyway, to illustrate how everybody had a platform, I can tell you that when I first met Emilio Delgado, who ended up playing Luis on Sesame Street, I thought uh, that he was an activist before I realized he was an actor. Because as a supporter of Cesar Chavez and the National Farm Workers Association, he would pin a boycott grapes button on everybody he came in contact with. So I thought he was like an advisor to come speak to us about the Mexican-American experience. And it was a while, uh, a couple of days of seeing him hanging around the studio that I realized that he was a performer. Even President Johnson was affected by this sensibility of uh, creating the great society, which I think paved the way for Head Start, that organization that helped us see preschoolers in a new way. The idealistic idea behind the show was that with self-esteem and armed with cognitive skills, underprivileged children would start school on the same level as their middle-class peers. I'll never forget the first time I saw Sesame Street. I walked into the student union of Carnegie Mellon University and there on a screen was, on a black and white television, was a very bald, very young James Earl Jones reciting the alphabet in a very deliberate manner, A, B, C, as the letters flashed over his head. I thought I was watching a show that taught lip reading or something. It was the oddest thing I ever saw in my life. But what really struck me was when I saw this Susan and Gordon, this urban, warm, friendly, African-American couple talking to me from a place that looked like my neighborhood. I was amazed. And let me remind you that in 1969, you did not see people of color on television. And if you did, they weren't the cute and charming Susan and Gordon. Uh, it had special meaning for me. As you were told, I'm Puerto Rican, born and raised in the South Bronx in a poor neighborhood. And I watched a lot of television growing up and never seeing anybody who looked like me or lived in the same neighborhood that I did made me feel that I didn't exist in society. It made me feel invisible. And I wondered how I, what I was gonna contribute to a society that didn't see me. My retirement from the show has prompted many questions. One of them, how could I have ended up on Sesame Street? If you had told me when I was a kid that I was gonna end up on a television show, I would have suggested you commit yourself to the nearest insane asylum. Why did I do it? How did I do it? Good luck, timing, being in the right place at the right time of this incredible social change. But anyway, uh, I pondered my childhood and my journey, and I put it in a book called Becoming Maria, Love and Chaos in the South Bronx. And I hope that there are some photos here that Jesse's going to put up for you to see. That's the cover. It's not me, but it could have been me. That's how we used to go to school. I used to carry un bulto like that, which is what we called our book cases. Next picture, please. Uh, that's me as an adorable uh, baby in the corner. My family, we were dressed up, uh, even going to an amusement park because it was Sunday and we had come from church. My mother in Puerto Rico, uh, my father, I guess I was a flower girl there and I, I, on the park bench there, I remember thinking I was the hottest tween in the world. My little brother in the corner and my sister and I at Coney Island, I remember that white bathing suit and that scowly face on my sister uh, her, is her co constant expression. She still looks that way. Next picture, please. That's me got graduating from high school. That's me with that horrible hairdo of the 60s. I think we made a, an extra hole in the ozone layer. I, we put so much hairspray on. And that's a junior high school class picture when everybody wanted to look like Kim Novak. 
and everybody wore a French twist. Next picture, please. That's my mother in Puerto Rico and my sister in Puerto Rico. And these pictures fascinated me because she, my mother looked so pretty in her little outfit and her little black and white shoes. But, and I used to wonder how could she look so pretty and live in that house? Uh, it, and I wondered about those children in the background. And I wondered uh, uh, about my sister there looking so prim and her little Mary Jane shoes. And then, uh, uh, I understood later that she was standing on a boardwalk that was the covering of a sewer system. And uh, my parents would talk about the harshness of Puerto Rico and why they had to leave to escape this grinding poverty. And I would look at the pictures and think of the grinding poverty that they escaped. But then my parents would take out guitars and start singing about how beautiful Puerto Rico was. So I was a little confused about that. I don't know if it was a good place or a bad place. Next picture, please. Oh, well, that's the end of my of the picture presentation. Thank you. Uh, so I put all of these thoughts in, uh, in, uh, in my book. Unfortunately, the story of my life also encompasses uh, domestic violence. My parents came to this, the mainland after World War II. Uh, uh, and found their way. My father worked on roofs. My mother was a seamstress. They said La Lucha all the time. They struggled with the system. They struggled with each other. I thought La Lucha was a was a, a, a greeting. When somebody would call on the phone, they'd say, here we are in La Lucha. They would meet somebody in the street and say, here we are uh, in La Lucha. But mostly they struggled with each other. I found ways of comforting myself by watching television. I love the stories of television. I love the order of shows like Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver. I lost myself in the stories and I found sanctuary in books, in books and in school uh, where there were there was order and opportunities for me to excel in. When I went to grade school, there was a system in place called the tracking system. If you were smart, you were in the smartest first grade class, second grade class, and so on and so forth for your whole life. If you were didn't speak English, had a disability, was troubled, was a felon, you were in the low achievers class. And you stayed in the low achievers class for your whole professional career for your whole educational career, que diga. So uh, I was always in the high achieving number one class. I had a very easy time of school uh, in the Bronx. All I had to do was show up and not cause anybody any trouble. My girlfriends and I would, uh, in junior high school, would do our nails in the desk and dry our nails and still get great grades. But then I went to the high school of performing arts, which is the fame school. There was a TV show and a movie about it too. Well, I, when I got into that school, I smacked up against the education gap because I went from being a star student in the Bronx to being a total failure in this middle-class school. Why? Because I didn't have the skills that these middle-class children had. Uh, I didn't know the difference between a debate and a fight. I didn't know what a noun was. I couldn't write an essay. These kids could stick to their point. I misunderstood uh, uh, assignments all the time. My method of learning was memorization, not really thinking. These kids had been to Europe on a regular basis. I had hardly been out of the Bronx. So maintaining a C average in high school took all of my energy I felt stupid and it's really hard to make up for an inferior elementary school education when you're struggling with puberty, which is all distracting. And I think that probably was the impulse for the show that I created Alma's Way. And Jesse will show you two pictures of that. Alma's Way is a show that I created for PBS Kids. It debuted on October 4th. And it's about thinking. I traveled the country and I noticed that a lot of elementary school kids uh, thought because they couldn't memorize, because they had to take so many tests, because they couldn't regurgitate what the teacher was telling them, they, was, they weren't as smart as they should be. So Alma's Way is about thinking. In every episode, there's a thought bubble, just like you see in this image. And Alma thinks and we see her thought process. 
Of course, I placed it in the Bronx. There's the number six train, which is a Puerto Rican icon. There was a t-shirt that people wore for a while that said the number six train to the Bronx and Puerto Rico. So of course that's in, uh, in, uh, in Alma's way. Her family is based on many members of my own family. Eddie Mambo is based on my cousin, uh, Eddie uh, Guagua Rivera, who was, uh, um, a musician. But anyway, I want kids to know that they could think regardless of what their situation is. Because even though I struggled in, in, in school, I knew I was smart. I'm very also very proud that this is one of the first shows that shows Afro Latinos in the father. The father is an Afro Puerto Rican. He's that handsome guy in the corner there. Uh, uh, so please tune into Alma's way and experience the joys that Alma goes through putting two and two together. Uh, as I, as I think about my education, I wonder about what my culture had on my, on it. As a child, I was told you could never ask an adult a question or look an adult in the eye. Uh, so I can't tell you how many times people, teacher said to me, look at me when I'm talking to you. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't. My mother told me I'm not, it's, I can't look you in the eye. It's disrespectful. I was 10 years old before uh, uh, I realized that I could ask a teacher a question and I would get an answer. It was remarkable. It was uh, Mr. Gitterman's class and he was teaching everybody long division and I said, uh, I, I just, everybody's Puerto Rican and just silently sitting there. And all of a sudden I burst out with a question, where did you get the number two? He says, I got it from the thing thing. And he broke the chalk on the blackboard. And I thought, what a miracle. You ask a question and you get, and you get an answer. So, and I've come to a lot of, of uh, I've come I've spoken at a lot of situations with the Hispanic parents, Latinx parents who have very close ties with their family, close knit families, so close, they're uncomfortable with letting their children accept internships or even accept scholarships to prestigious schools. And that story was told so beautifully in Real Women Have Curves, if you remember that story, America Ferrara's. Uh, story. Uh, and that exemplifies that very phenomenon that I'm talking about. Anyway, when I, after years of Sesame Street, I had some questions with the Latino content. And finally, a producer said, why don't you try writing some of these bits yourself? And that is how I started to write uh, for Sesame Street. And that, of course, led to the writing of books. As I said in the beginning, there were a lot of um, um, Muppets, uh, a more human, more human interest on Sesame Street, and then it became more Muppets. And then I still felt like I had a lot of energy, and I read a wonderful book, Frank McCourt's Angela's Ashes. It is a story of the most miserable Irish American childhood that you could think of, but it was so funny. And I had a tumultuous childhood, as I said, it was ruled by domestic violence. And I thought to myself, I had a tumultuous, miserable childhood, but still I have a sense of humor. There was funny things in it. I can write a story about that. And I did. My first picture book was called No Dogs Allowed. All of my books are based on true events. A box full of kittens is based on a true event as well. I was a little girl and my mother said, stay with, go stay with your aunt who was pregnant and she didn't have a phone, a landline. And my mother says, stay with her in case something happens, come get help because she was due. Well, I went to visit my aunt and stayed with her and watched to see if she was going to give birth any minute. And in my fantasy, I thought, oh, if she starts giving birth, I'll go get help. And then they're going to give me a parade because I would have saved the day. Well, nothing happened. But that was the idea that stayed in my heart and in my mind. And I was able to write a book about it uh, called uh, A Box Full of Kittens. 
I have to talk about my teacher, Mr. Gitterman, who said to me once that uh, uh, he was one who taught me, said I could ask him questions and get an answer. And also one time he said to me that my mother should read stories to me. And um, I said my, to her, you teacher says you have to read to me. And she pulled her hair out and she said, don't I got enough to do? It was very funny. Tell him I don't have any books. So I went back to Mr. Gitterman and I said, my mother said, we don't have any books. And he said, she doesn't have to read books. She could tell you stories of her life. So I went back and I told my mother that. And there began this wonderful relationship where she told me all about Puerto Rico. She told me where she was from, what her life was like as an orphan. Uh, she told me how she used to cross a bullpen in order to see her sister. She told me how she used to drink fresh water from a waterfall. She told me about the colors of Puerto Rico and I finally understood why she uh, painted the bathroom hot pink and turquoise. So this, this series of stories that she told me made me understand her better made me uh, uh, see her as a full person, not just the mother who struggled with my father and struggled with raising us. I was proud of her all of a sudden. Uh, and I think that that's the wonderful thing that books do to people. The, another story that has to do with Mr. Gitterman is he read Charlotte's Web to us. And he didn't have to do that. It wasn't in the curriculum. But every day he would read a little bit about Charlotte's Web. And I was just thrilled by this book, even though I couldn't stand Wilbur the pig. As you know, Charlotte is the spider who's working and raising kids and making the web. And Wilbur needs her help all the time. And I thought to myself, why should she help him? She's got enough to do with all those kids and all that web building. And he's just a load. And I realize now as an adult that I put myself in that book. I was surrounded by overwhelmed women who had too many children. So that's what I saw in the book. So I always tell uh, adults who help children with reading, that let them put their own sensibility into it. It doesn't matter that it's the sensibility that the author intended. It only matters that um, that the, the child is as engaged as I was when Mr. Gitterman read Charlotte's Web to us. Um, another reading experience was I remember the exact moment I knew how to read we used to read Dick and Jane books in elementary school. And as you know, they were very old fashioned and it was see Jane run, run Jane run, see Dick run. And, you know, they were blonde and blue eyed. They couldn't have been more different. None of us were blonde and blue eyed. We were all uh, Latinx. And she wasn't a very interesting teacher. And she used to make us all read the same page. And I was ahead of them. I could read quickly. So I would have to wait for everybody to catch up and, and daydream and, and do whatever kids uh, do when they have nothing to do and they go into their minds. And uh, one day I'm on the train with my grouchy sister and I asked her what the ads above her head said. And she rolled her eyes and said, oh, why don't you try reading it? And I thought reading, I thought reading was something you did with Dick and Jane books in school. I didn't know that reading was something that you did in the world, that you could read letters anywhere, a bus stop, a sign was reading. Well, I looked up and all of a sudden, all the words and all the sounds went ch -ch 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 and I read and I read all about the hopes and dreams of Miss Subway's 1957 and, and how smoking Chesterfield cigarettes was good for you. 
This was the, actually the ads of the day. So I think it's curious that as a kid, I didn't know that reading was something that you could uh, do everywhere. I thought it was a an empty exercise that the teacher makes me made me go through. And I wonder if kids today still need that that little suggestion. Read the sign, read the soda bottle, read the cereal box. Books do bring us together. I loved Mary Carr's book, The Liars Club. And um, it's about these hard drinking, tough, white Oklahoma, uh, Texas, they're not in Oklahoma, they're Texas, East Texas family. And um, I, I, I just connected to that book so much that when I met her at a book signing, I said to her, uh, I'm Sonia Manzano, I'm Puerto Rican, I was raised in the South Bronx, and I wish you'd stop writing about me. It was the most uh, complimentary thing I could say to her because even though the story had nothing to do with me, it really, uh, I really connected with it. Uh, a story that also is not of my culture that I wrote is, as you heard, coming up Cuban. I'm not Cuban, I am uh, uh, Puerto Rican, but I fell into this rabbit hole of interest of what was going on when Castro took over. And I was curious about what happened to kids, those who left and those who had to stay in Cuba. So uh, the world of books and libraries and librarians, by the way, I couldn't have written Coming Up Cuban without the help of librarians at the Cuban Cultural Center in Miami. If any of you are out there, thanks again. They uh, helped me with photos and even personal stories about what went on. So uh, uh, in these trying times of, um, of racism in the country and division in the country, I think that probably books is uh, a final hope and a, a, a real possibility of bringing things together even for a moment, even for a moment when people connect with books. Uh, um, I think that brings me to the end of the half hour I was allotted to speak. Thank you for listening. And now I'd love to entertain some questions and have some conversation. Wow, what a amazing story, really. Um, I am so, uh, impressed about the resilience, the the, the fearless, um, the risk, the learning that you had never stopped learning. So thank you so much, Sonia, for sharing with us your your story, an inspiring story. And Thanks. of course, we have questions. Um, so I'm going to start with one of these good questions that uh, people have uh, sent us. Uh, this is a question for uh, Keisha. Uh, she's a student at CPCC, and she said, you broke the ground as being the one of the most influential Latinas in television. Do you see more cultural culture diversity developing in Sesame Street? Yes, I think that things are certainly much more Cultural diversity is much more uh, apparent on Sesame Street and in television in general. The uh, African-American community has made greater strides than the Latinx community. I love shows like Atlanta. I love uh, Insecure because it's a glimpse. I love Blackish because it's like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Oh, wow, I want to know that. So there's many, many stories there that inspire me. And I think that that uh, we're coming up, the Latinx community is coming up with uh, 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 more stories that will be inspiring. It's, it's very difficult because even the well-meaning gatekeepers say they want to diversify their programming 
As soon as you mention something that they're not familiar with, they get nervous and they're not sure if they should do it. And or they'll say, well, well, I know this Cuban and they don't agree with that. Or I know this Dominican and they don't agree with that. So that we try, they push us all together and stories don't get told. But things are certainly improving. Yeah. You mentioned in your presentation that, you know, you were in the right place at the right time. Uh, so somehow there is this star, the lucky star that has followed you. And I wonder for many um, Latino writers uh, that don't have that star, are, are, do you have any advice for, um, for new writers that, you know, that do not come from the mainstream community to pursue it, even though they are not right now in the right place at the right time? What yeah. can we do to continue to pursue, to produce uh, quality television or to continue writing beautiful books like you're doing? Well, I think, you know, it's easier to write a book because you could write that by yourself. A lot of people are writing books first before it's a television show because it's easier to present it as a, as a assembled book and a book you could write alone. You don't need a lot of people to write a book. So I think you have to keep you have to write every day if you're a writer and you have to write from your heart. You can't, uh, uh, you know, write with the thought, this is going to be a TV show or this is going to get an award. You have to tell your story as sincerely as you can. And that will get uh, uh, people's interest, but it really is a lot of, I'm very stubborn. I'm very, um, my mother used to say, call me a maniac. She, because when I had an idea, I just couldn't let it go. And uh, uh, so that worked in my, in my favor. But I have to say this, Michelle Obama's mother said this. They said to her, Mrs. Robinson, uh, uh, you must be proud of Michelle and Craig, your children. And Mrs. Robinson, Michelle Obama's mother said, I am proud of them. But there's lots of kids. There were a lot of kids like them in the south side of Chicago. Y me sorprende. You know, I was surprised. I said, that's right. That's right. So I think there were other kids like me who had the capability. They didn't have the opportunity. But they had the talent and the capability and all of that. So I really want to impress that, you know, in young people. Uh, it's not complying to some uh, higher level. You have the capability already in you. Thank you for that answer. Um, well, another question. It's uh, what was the most rewarding part of working on Sesame Street? And what was the least rewarding part of being part of that series? I think the most rewarding part is now really because the children who watch me are old. So they tell me, uh, oh, you made such an impression on me. I never would have gone. You reminded me of my mother or my tia. Uh, I would have been, I never would have thought about being a journalist if I hadn't seen you. And that is uh, the most gratifying thing. And what's the worst thing about Sesame Street? Oh, I don't know. I really. Uh, and I'm not, um, I'm not being insincere. What you saw is what you got. Sesame Street is a very sincere show. And that's why it was, it was so successful. I can't, um, I was proud of the sad moments when we did Goodbye, Mr. Hooper. And we talked about death on the show. It was the first time that anybody had done that. And it's really, uh, it gives me nourishment being around young people because young people have answers. They're not empty vessels that you just inform them. And being around the very young people energizes me. So that was certainly another plus. Yeah. Um, another question is, do you believe your work and the, ses the, the themes on Sesame Street, Street broke barriers in children's education and why? There were, Sesame Street wasn't the first television show to teach. There were teaching shows. They were really, really boring. There was a person just standing there 
with a book, just teaching. Joan Cooney said, we wanted to have very high production values and we wanted to mimic the landscape of television. So those were the days of Flip Wilson, Carol Burnett, variety shows, laughing. So Ses and it was entertaining and funny. And so that was the big difference that Joan Cooney uh, uh, instigated and, and put into the program. The other thing that she, I watched the documentary Street Gang recently, and she, um, she was interviewed and she said, the people who run the world, the people who run the United States can read, therefore, underserved children have to read. And it, it, it's beautiful in its simplicity, isn't it? Yeah. It's just, and she said that. And uh, do watch that documentary, Street Gang. You'll see how the show was banned in Mississippi mm -hmm. when it was first aired because there was a black child sharing an ice cream with a white child and they didn't want to show that in Mississippi. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about the diversity uh, comments that I usually do, but I think that I'm disappointed that we haven't made larger strides. I mean, I thought, been there, done that with Sesame Street, you know, that we weren't going to have these terrible problems. I always knew there was racism. I didn't realize how insidious it was, how deep it was uh, until now, yeah. because we are seeing it. Uh, but um, I, I have faith in young people. I really do. I mean, that's why they don't listen to us. And it's a good thing. <laughs> I mean, the young people don't have worry about, don't worry about wearing masks or learning about Latinos in history books, or it's the adults, you know, it's the, it's, it's us. And so, uh, uh, so I have faith that they'll, they'll in their hearts find answers that we haven't been able to find for them. All we have to do is keep that spirit alive in them through books, through conversation, not by giving them answers and lessons, but by letting them come up with their own notions. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful answer. Um, I was really um, touched by the story you mentioned that you talk about your, your mom and somehow her not seeing the power that she had in her own stories. Uh, I mean, maybe she couldn't read a picture book or didn't really find it. Why for? But the the the, the connection that you mentioned on on bringing the her legacy uh, and and again giving power to that story. And and you said that you saw her now in a in a you saw her right. in a different uh, um, way. Uh, I really love that message for any uh, Latino parents or any other immigrant parent that is watching us today to see that it, there is value in what they're bringing. It, it, there's so much value in it. And I would ask, you know, and I in, in those days to read a book was to be lazy. You should have been washing the dishes or changing somebody's diaper or li limpiando, you know, and uh, cleaning up. And, uh, but those stories were, were so important to me. And I would try uh, with my father and he would say, oh, ya so paso, eso no importa. Uh, and, and he would never, I would tell him, he would sing songs and I would say, where is that song from? He would say, mama, yo quiero saber de donde son los cantantes. Everybody, where is that song from, papi? Nah, not canción vieja. He never wanted to share anything. And I lost him and, you know, we had a strained relationship. But, and I don't know his his legacy. So, so uh, you know, talk to your children. If you can't, uh, uh, they're interested. They want to know what you wore to school and what you ate and what you were afraid of and if bugs made you feel creepy and, 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 uh, and they'll, they'll see you as a bigger person in the world. Yeah, yeah. Now we have a very unique story by Maria. Um, and Maria said, how did you get Lin-Manuel Miranda to write this, the, 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 the theme the song, Alma's Way? What, what was the secret here? 
<laughs> I knew his father. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's uh, he was on Sesame Street. Lynn Manuel was on Sesame mm -hmm. Street, okay. and uh, so I I knew him then. But his father, Luis Miranda, was uh, 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 very active. He's about my age. He was very active in the Puerto Rican community way back since he got here from Puerto Rico, you know, years ago. And so I knew him as a social activist and I, I you know, kind of, it was easy to get a hold of him. So I called Lynn, he's very busy, he's wonderful, doing so so many things. I finally called his father and I said, este, quiero comunicarme con tu hijo. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so, and as you know, Lynn Manuel can say in in a few words what it takes us many. So he was able to do the Almas Way theme, and I said, I want Lelo Lai, I want Bomba, I want salsa, I want rap, I want the whole Bronx thing, and he uh, he 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 came up with the wonderful theme. And I think, let me say this that. I started out in the Bronx and and now I'm back in the Bronx. I'm back in the Bronx with Alma's Way. So isn't that an interesting journey? And so people always say to me, oh, you became such a big success because you overcame your childhood. I didn't overcome it. I never forgot it. I was always something in my mind. I always felt that I was a success as Maria because I never forgot that there was another kid watching television, What you know, you know, what are you going to do, say about me? Or how are you going to show me? So because I never forgot that past, I was able to incorporate it into a successful future. So so I always tell young people, don't forget who you are. Who you are is who you are. There's nobody else like that. That's what you got going for you. That's the gold. That's, that's the most important thing that you should hold on to and use it as a stepping off point yeah it's um, um i was thinking about that because you know you have this playful way of being you have not lost the child in you and uh and now I, I understand part of that is, is what you just said but going beyond you know we are living very interesting times I know. and uh and after covid and you know uh what is it that inside of you has made you, you know, keep that light shining? Um, you, you know, you mentioned COVID and people say like, what should we tell kids? You know, and I always say, be truthful with them about COVID. Tell them that <clears throat> you can't say it's going to be all right. Don't worry about it because they know that it's that you don't know what the answer is going to be. And I remember, uh, when my mother used to go to work in the factory, she was the only mother who worked. And I thought to myself that she went to work because she didn't want to be with us. That's what I thought. And I asked her, why do you go to work? And she said, oh, I would love to stay home with you, but we can't make it on your father's income. We couldn't, I had to go to work. So all of a sudden I felt, oh, I got it. Ahora entiendo. Ahora entiendo la situación and I could help. You know, so I felt like I was part of the tribe all of a sudden. So I always say that, don't tell them that it's all going to be all right, because they know they'll think worse things. But do tell them that you're in it together, that you're in it together. And I felt that by me not crying when mommy went to work was my way of helping us uh, be together. So I always say, share the issues of the day with your uh, you know, with your children. As far as my own desire or my own enthusiasm for living, I've just always been that way. I've just been curious. If I live 10 lifetimes, I, don't, I won't have a chance to read every book ever written or see every <laughs> movie or, or, or learn uh, all that I would like to. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I, it would be, you know, inspiring for everybody to pick a little bit of that. You know, yes, a and I bit of you a little bit of you that will keep us continue, especially uh, you know, and sometimes with the apathy that came after COVID, and and having that having that spirit and in connection with childhood, um, being I love what you say being authentic uh, with your children, say the truth, be truthful to what's existing. So I I, I really appreciate those words. Thank you. And 
We have more questions. I'm not sure, uh, uh, Jesse, if you wanted to uh, ask up some of the questions or um, I have so many questions here. Ah. I can continue talking, but I want to just share with you um, if you have any, any questions, Jesse. And and Jesse was, um, I'm not sure if she's coming up. Yes. Yeah, Jesse. Hi, everyone. No, I don't have specific questions, but if you want to keep going, Irania, if okay. anyone who's watching would like to put some questions in the comments, we can absolutely. Pop yes, please. Yeah. Um, but I have more questions. You got so many questions, uh, Sonia. Um, the one question here is how have you sought for representation of yourself in media? And have you found it? Uh, Interesting question. Have I found people who are like me specifically? Yeah, I guess the image, the your the, your your representation. Are, are you happy with what media have portrayed about who you are? Is oh. that is that is that who you are? Because you know sometimes media uh, distort or it's it's not exactly that 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 you know yeah right your right. image no i think that i i think in the beginning i was a little nervous uh when i first got on sesame street um i mean i was like eight 20 years old and and matt robinson who was the original gordon said to me you're not here just to be the cute little latina you have to make sure the Hispanic content is is appropriate. And I thought, me? Who elected me president of Puerto Ricans? I'm just like 20 years old. I'm just, <laughs> I was in a show called Godspell. I mean, how could that be my responsibility? Yeah. I'm not the leader. And then it stayed with me, though. His comments stayed with me. And there used to be a fruit cart on the show. And it had apples and bananas and the regular stuff like that. And I went to the producers and I said, if this was a real diverse neighborhood, there would be platanos and yautia and, and you know, ethnic fruit. So they did it. They put that fruit in the cart. So I always say, oh, I, I diversified the first fruit cart on television. <laughs> and it seems like a simple thing. I was nervous to ask it, but it also taught me this. Everybody has a little bit of power. I had a little bit of power there. It wasn't a lot. I was 20, but I got the fruit cart changed. So I always also tell people, you know, you have a little bit of say, you have a little bit of, you know, in the things that, that, uh, go around you. And, and I'll add this about diversity. I'm trying to get all my thoughts across. Uh, a diverse group comes up with better solutions, okay? Like I was helping the Bronx River Alliance and they clean up the Bronx River. That's the goal. The Bronx River connects the richest community, Westchester, with the one I was raised in the South Bronx. One river. The goal is to clean it. So when we have meetings, there's these rich people, there's poor people, there's old people, there's young people, but we don't have to, we don't have to get to know each other or like each other. The goal is clean the river. And when you look at the problem from different aspects, because it's a diverse group, you come up with better solutions. So that was apropos of absolutely nothing. That wasn't what you asked me. But I think that if you're in a group and you want to uh, solve a problem, uh, look for someone who doesn't look like you or make the same amount of money or is a different age. And they'll see it differently and you'll, you'll come up with sharper solutions. Thank you for saying that. Um, another question, and um, I think it's Kelsey. Kelsey from CMS, Shalom Mecklenburg School, she said, what was the uh, the favorite moment in your career? I think the most exciting moment for me was when Stevie Wonder, do you all know who the great Stevie Wonder yes. was, is? And he came to Sesame Street and he sang very superstitious. 
or very superstition, I think the name of the song was. And it was just, the whole studio was rocking out. It was old people, young people, white people, black people, kids, everybody was on the same page during that song. It was uh, one of the most thrilling things. And uh, the other thrilling moment on Sesame Street was I walked in and there's Lena Horne, the great African-American activist, jazz singer, beautiful, gorgeous looking woman uh, who had been through so much. I walk into the studio and she's singing, It's Not Easy Being Green with Kermit the Frog. And I wasn't a writer, so I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes at that time. And I thought, is she singing about what I think she's singing about? Because obviously it had um, racial sensibility somehow. Uh, uh, if you saw it that way, if you were of that age and that sensibility, if you weren't, you just saw about Kermit being unhappy about uh, being a frog, but it was, it was a uh, wonderful thing that Sesame Street did where it implied a lot, mm -hmm. it said many, many things um, uh, which the thinking child could take home with them. And I think that's an exciting thing about kids. Uh, in Alma's way, we have, uh, we have a guido, we have uh, a pava. Uh, a guido is an instrument, a Puerto Rican instrument. We have a pava, which is a Puerto Rican hat on the wall. Because we have vigigantes, Vigante, yeah. a Puerto Rican uh, icon. And so we have those images on, on Alma's way. And They'll notice it. Puerto Rican kids are going to go, oh, wait, that looks so great. That looks like something that has to do with me. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, and that's important. Yes, the, the authenticity to the culture. And, uh, you know, you were emerged in, in a world of, um, that we call it edutainment, combination of education and entertainment. And there, there are, you know, the format of edutainment in in these days is very different from the past. So what do you think in your opinion are quality indicators of a show, uh, maybe like Sesame Street, but any show that pursue edutainment in your opinion, what, it, what is it that that show has to have that we can as parents determine, oh, this is, or as a child, yeah. say, hmm, this is a quality show. It can't look down on the kid. If the show is like, like you're not that smart and I'm giving you this kind of lesson, that they'll, the kids will turn off to that immediately. Uh, take a movie like Encanto, that was like a great movie and it had high production values and it didn't look down on anyone and the characters were real. I mean, they, I mean, they were animated characters obviously, but they came from a sincere place. And I think that's uh, what parents should look for, that it has real emotions, even if they're penguins or whatever, they don't have to uh, 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 be people, but it's a real jump from like, I, I used to watch the Looney Tunes uh, cartoons and I, uh, uh, they, they, you know, there were jokes about World War II in them, and there were, uh, you know, there was a one gave me nightmares for weeks because it was a, a submarine that came out with an eye, an eyeball, and it chased the enemy around. Well, I thought that something was chasing me around, and you know, I mean, those are real obvious, thoughtless images. Well, that frighten children and, uh, you know, but we've come a long way from that, but it still can't be just corny. It has to be s smart. <laughs> like Maria thinking. Yeah, it has to be thoughtful. If you the finanza, the riddle have to be there. Yes, right, right. Yes. And I think it's, we're almost, uh, you know, about to enter our amazing conversation. I mean, we're really so honored to be celebrating Dia de los Niños with you, Sonia. Thank you so much. And Jesse, if you wanna say our final words. 
Yes, I just echo the thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you for all that you shared. It was a wonderful program. Thanks to everyone who was watching and all the great comments we had. We would love to see you for the rest of April for the rest of our DIA programs. You can check them out on our calendar, cmlibrary.org slash calendar, and we would love to see you there. We hope everyone has a great night. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Adios. Suerte. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Muchas gracias.